Hey everyone, you're watching Conversations in Pop Culture, and I am your host, Andrew Davis, and this episode is brought to you by my sponsors, BCW Supplies. Use code POPANIMECOMS to get 10% off your entire order. Um, they sell bags, boards, long boxes. They sell Xenoscope, Xenoscope long boxes. I can't speak today. Um, but So save yourself some money. It's an affiliate link. I get a little money back, which helps keep this show active. And I do have a major announcement. Um, I am creating a sub stack teaching comic book investing, and that should be up in the next two weeks. So if you want to learn how to invest in comic books, I'm your boy, and that's where we're going to go with all this. And so that's what I got going on. And without further ado, I have with me legendary writer and now comedian Raven Gregory. So welcome back to the show. Hey, what's up, Andrew? I'm actually also opening up a sub stack on how to roll blunts using rollers you get from the smoke shop. It's going to be dope. I'm going to be charging in weed. So if you guys want to send me weed, we're going to have to figure out the particulars on how you're going to do that. But you send me weed, and I teach you how to roll that weed. And then you keep sending me that weed, and then I keep smoking that weed, and then we just have a good-ass time. Substack, Raven Gregory, 2002. What's up? Well, there, there, there we go. We, we've now gotten the promotion part out of this entire show. Yeah. Yeah. Um Obviously, you got a lot going on, though, right now, and there's a lot of cool stuff going on with you in comics right now, I feel. And the thing that I kind of want to talk about is Widow's Web, because obviously the first issue, which I got it right here, and I know my lighting is bad, guys. I understand my lighting is not great. You know, we're all going to have to deal with my lighting. This is a better picture of it. Um, oh, this nice. Right here. You know, you know but... uh. What's going on with Widow's Web? Because I know that you funded the second one on Kickstarter. I know that it's for issues one through six. I think the first issue is done. And what's the basic story for those who don't know about it? Because I think this is some of your best writing that you've done in a while. Okay. Uh, well, the basic gist is, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, God, I haven't pitched this book in so long. I forgot what the shit's about. It's a horror book about boy meets girl, but in this case, the girl may very well eat the boy. It's one of those crazy sci-fi mysteries set in a world where people aren't really people. They're kind of like half insect, half people, weird shit. It's dope. I hope you guys get a chance to check it out. Go to eBay. Buy it. That's how we plug that shit. Nah, but um, I'm an alcoholic, and I have a lot of mental issues, and I finally start getting them under control and shit. But the book was supposed to be done back in 2013. We had the book all penciled and lettered and all that shit. And we were just getting it colored. And then uh, my brain went insane. And I started spending a lot of time in the psych ward, which was good times. Lots of fun. I highly recommend psych wards to anyone who feels they might have lost their fucking mind. Um, but now that my brain is finally getting back to play, uh, we recently put out four issue four and five. Issue six is the last issue. Once we have issue six colored and lettered because the pencils are already done, we're going to be doing a Kickstarter for the last three issues and putting this puppy to bed. Getting this shit done. That was just dope. I like how you do that shit. Technology. I do not know how to use that shit. So so, so let's even talk about this because obviously one one of the things that is so interesting about Widow's Web is that Obviously, Autumn Ivy is involved, and I like her. She's been on my other show, and, and I'm still friendly with her. And so she's your co-writer on it. Um, and one of the things – I don't know. You give me, like, that look like I did something wrong. Like, No, nah, I'm just smoking weed, looking at my face in the mirror. I mean, looking at my face in the uh, the view to see how the smoke is going up my nose to make sure I'm getting, sure. getting hot. So what, what is this like to come back into it? Because obviously, you know, you started this back 2013. I think one of them came out in 2015. And then what is this like to come back into this series? Because, you know, when time passes by, you know, and this is one of my pet peeves about indie comics is that somebody starts a project and then they never finish it. And so what is this like for you that you're finishing it? Because I think that's a big issue right now in comics. A lot of it is is I get I'm I'm getting a perspective on life that I didn't get before. A lot of people are familiar with that famous Neil Gaiman, uh, George George R. Martin is not your bitch poem or writing. 
And just like you, you get a sense that life happens. I mean, I worked hard in comics for 20 years and I busted my ass and I was writing like five scripts a month, putting out product every just like living the life. And then, you know, my wife died. I started doing this Kickstarter and, you know, you're your own boss. And the mentality that comes into it is when, uh, when you're working with a company, you have editors, you have pencilers, you have all these people working with you that are depending on you to get shit done in time. And that motivates you a lot more than, you know, when you're, when you're fat, when you're well fed, when you're not like struggling, there's a lot of shit. Like you have time to go crazy. You have time to lose your mind. And as you get older, I mean, everybody know anybody who's over the age of 25 knows that shit changes as you grow in life. Your brain changes, your body changes, health issue changes, life in general changes, politics, religion, freaking this whole world. COVID fucked everything up for everybody for a long time. So it's it's like I remember back in the days when Joe Mad couldn't finish Battle Chasers. I was like, what the what's your deal, dude? Or 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 Joe Benitez on Lady Mechanica. Now I look at it as shit happens, man. If it gets finished, I I'll be happy. I would have to go back and reread the whole shit again to enjoy it properly, which is annoying. And it feels somewhat like a broken promise that the creator makes to the reader that this story is going to come out in a presentable amount of time. But now I'm like, eh, I get it. I'm, I'm more, I'm more of the mind of, I would very much like to finish this. So the whole story could be told so that the fans can get the ending they deserve and so that I can move on to the next piece, because it's it's hard to to want to do something else if you're stuck in the past on a book. Like, there's been plenty of times I've been like, ah, shit, I should just be like, fuck it. I mean, realistically speaking, I did that with The Gift. The Gift was supposed to go on for 50 issues, but if people ain't buying your comic, you can't go on for 50 issues, you know? So it's like, yeah. where, where is where is the, the barometer so, so. to meet it? Between, okay, say the fans come out and they, they pay a hundred grand and they buy your book. They buy the second book for a hundred grand. They buy your book. They buy the next book, hundred grand. I think kind of maybe they deserve that fourth book because they're putting out the money. But if you got five people coming out buying your book, you gonna you gonna kill yourself over five people. You know, not that many people buy buy the book to where it's like, oh God, I'm getting messages every every freaking day, and I'm not. So, saying let's even talk about that because this is one of the things that's interesting about comics. Back in the day and in the '90s, I mean, obviously there's a lot of speculation and there's a lot of you know over purchasing, but comic sales were much higher. And now, you know, if you sell you know forty thousand copies of a book you're doing pretty well in, in a title. So what, what is this like for you? Because you've lived through, I think, both of those cycles. And so what is that like for you? Because obviously you have massive perspective now that you're 20 plus years in the business. You've obviously worked for Xanascope. You've had stuff, you know, done, published to indie with like the gift and things of that nature. And so, and now you're doing it also on your own. And so what is this like? Because the entire industry has changed dramatically and, I guess what what is a healthy number is really where where I, I guess this question's going. Um, I don't know, man. I couldn't tell you because everything you just said. I mean, keep in mind when I first started getting comics, we had like freaking Nintendo, no Super Nintendo. We had Nintendo. <clears throat> we did not have multi-million dollar blockbuster movies with CGI. We did not have full access to porn at our fingertips. So comics were competing with a lot less. And as technology and advancements have moved forward, all of a sudden comics are becoming more and more of a niche group. Like for every blockbuster movie that comes out with a comic, I doubt half of those people are like, oh, shit, you know what? I just saw this amazing movie. 
I should go read the comic book. They're just freaking strip mining that shit for IPs to make into amazing movies. But they don't do nothing for the comic other than to keep the comic going because they want the ideas. So looking at numbers, I mean, you look at Pat Chan. Pat Chan's about to hit 75 grand on Kickstarter. Like he, I'm not saying he don't need the brick and mortar stores, but he really don't need it. He's going directly to the customer. So the way people consume the things they love has vastly changed to where just because you ain't like back back in the day, if a book was selling 5,000 units independent, that book was considered a success. To Marvel, if you're selling under 30 grand, that is a that is a burden. That is a bomb. So I don't even really concern myself with numbers anymore. I just concern myself with putting out some kind of product that I love. If I love it, and I've learned this from everything I've done in my life, if I personally love it and I put the energy and effort into it to develop something that I'm passionate about, somebody out there will feel the same way. So so to even talk about that, because obviously, you know, I like your writing and th there's a whole common, you know, myth. And I have this when I speak to advertisers for this show, where they're like, oh, you need to have a huge audience. And my argument to them is saying, look, you don't need a huge audience. You need the right audience. Either you have the right audience and you have a small audience that's willing to spend a good amount of money then, you know, they're more than, they can more than substantiate and keep you afloat or even make you prosper. <laughs> so do you also feel that, you know, when you find the right audience, because I think with Widow's Web, it's a good example where those people come out and they really help to make that project happen. And do you think that's where we're sort of shifting in comics, where it's not so much that you need necessarily a huge audience, you need the right audience and you almost need the right price point, I feel. That's a good question. That is a good question. I don't know. I don't know how to particularly answer that. I mean, my my thoughts on the matter is, is again, I don't ever even worry about the audience I'm trying to reach. I don't like look for a particular demographic. I look at things in the sense of, again, putting out the best product, something close to your heart. And then there's a whole nother facet of it where you're trying to game the system because a lot of people don't realize you could be the best fucking writer in the world. But if people aren't seeing your shit, if it's not being exposed to the right people, same with like a podcast, you could do the most amazing podcast in the world. But sometimes, like you were saying, it takes a while for the audience to find it or the right audience to find it for them to start telling the other people about this shit. And then next thing you know, you have a Joe Rogan show. He was just doing shit for shits and giggles. He was doing what made him happy. And that became this huge freaking thing. But if he had gone into it like, hey, I'm doing this show to reach a particular group of individuals, you know, it, it kind of it, it taints the experience. That's, that's, that's why I feel really strongly about People should really focus more on doing what they love and what makes them happy and doing it well than think about the fight. If you look at things through a financial perspective, everybody always goes blind in the end because you're so you so you for one. I recently did a signing, Andrew. I did a signing for the first time in years, and it was right after covid. And everybody, you could tell from people, they were happy just to be around people again. It had been a long time since we've inter interacted with people. And when I did this sighted, Ali Garza taught me something a long time ago. He taught me at a convention. He's like, when I come out to a show, I don't care how much money I make. I'm just there for the fans. And in my head, I'm like, shut the fuck up. This is some bullshit. <laughs> because, I mean, dude, I got bills. When I go to a show, I'm like, Fuck, how am I going to pay my electric bill this month? You know, that kind of shit. Everybody got shit they got to deal with. If you make big money, you get to go to the strip club and see titties. You know, that kind of shit. So when he had said that to me, I didn't buy into it. But years later at this signing, I just went and I just had fun. 
I talk to every single customer in there. I talk to the store owners. I talk to the other artists. And I had genuine conversations. And I had the best time of my fucking life. Didn't make any money at all. And I can honestly say, one time I did a show and I made like three grand in a day. I don't remember anything I bought with that three grand. Nothing, but that signing where I didn't make a dime and I just was in the moment, in the present with people that I genuinely wanted to be with, that's something I'll keep with me for the rest of my life. So what's the win, you know? Like, is the money the win or is the memory, the experience that defines you? This is interesting. This is really interesting because what happened to me in January is I ran a Kickstarter for this show and my January was a fucking hell of a January and it was like one of the most miserable months I ever had, you know, where there were some people who were really supportive and believe me, I'm very happy. I met some very interesting people who supported my show. And, but at the same time, I also met some really horrible <laughs> people who attacked my show. And it was, and look, I'm just trying to support this show. And it goes back to the idea where I got bills to pay, you know, running this podcast, it's not free. You know, you, know, you got to pay for stream yard. There's other costs that people don't realize. You know, also, you know, you want to expand. You want to make sure some of your social media and your bills are covered. And so I don't think I'm coming back. And I think I'm going to find another way how to fund because I really want to go back to what this entire first season was, which is what you were talking about. Where I was just interviewing really interesting and cool people. And yeah. I was having a blast in those 90 episodes. And I am slowly transitioning back into that mindset. Wow. And also kind of doing... I don't think. And what I'm hoping for is that the money will come and follow and people be like, yo, I really like your show. How do I help you out? Or an advertiser will be like, yo, you have a really good audience. And I did have sponsors before. And obviously I did well by them because my audience trusted me. So, you know, it's very interesting this because I think it's a real divide in the comic community right now where there are people who are running it like a business. And then there are people saying, look, you know, Hey, you also need to understand how to have a good time. So it's, it's tricky for me. And I, I don't produce a comic. I just produce a so it's a really interesting thing. Well, I mean, the other thing is, is I don't know if you know this, Andrew, but most comic creators and are anybody broke. out there watching this shit, I'm talking to you, motherfuckers. We are not the most business-minded, organized individuals in the world. Some of us were supposed to be on a podcast last week and forgot we were supposed to be on it because we don't know how to work schedules. That was me, by the way. I forgot I was supposed to do this last week. Um, so, I mean, I understand, I understand the sense of, excuse me, if any of you out there are into porn where big, fat, black guys blow their nose and shit, holla at me. I will charge you like $5 a month trying to make this comedy money work. Um, yeah, I understand the perspective from uh, business businesses and whatnot because, I mean, creators can make businesses a lot of money, but we can also lose them a lot of money too. And those folks have to answer to, uh, you know, investors and all that shit. So, I mean, it's a very difficult... Hold on one second. Alexa, turn off TV. Okay. Sorry, folks. I had to talk to Skynet and tell her to matrix my TV off because I've was i I've been watching Sharks for the last... I only get to sleep today because my schedule is so packed now. So I like I threw in three hours and then I just put on... All of a sudden, I see on Hulu shark shit. Like it's shark month or something, which I'm pretty sure it is. But there's, <laughs> uh, there's this, there's, this freaking series about killer whales killing great white sharks and i'm just like oh shit this is dope this is like four-year-old raven's dream class of the titans so yeah i've been sleeping the shark shit for the last three hours before this podcast ah. and then i went to the aquarium yesterday and got to take that picture with the big giant jaws but i went on mushrooms so i was high as fuck I went, I went, my son gave me a mushroom pill that I gave him 
like in case break glass in case of emergency type shit for like mentally. I was like, here, if you need something to like clear your head, feel clean, keep it. He never took that shit, gave it to me and was like, dad, I'm taking you and my son to the aquarium. And holy shit, I turned into a four year old kid running through this shit. But I was like a comedian, four year old kid. So I'm talking shit everywhere. I'm fucking going. I go to see the fucking penguins. I'm like, oh shit, there's penguins. I get to see. I didn't know if you knew this, Andrew, but sea lions rape penguins. <laughs> this is real shit. You can look this shit, shit up on YouTube. Sea lions don't ask for consent at all. They hold the penguin down and then just fuck. They're not eating them or nothing. They're fucking pain. Like they're like, Fuck these fat bitches, other sea lions and shit. I'm fucking these penguins. No joke. So I wanted to see who survived the onslaught of sea lion dick and was like, where are the penguins? So I, I went to the penguin exhibit and there was no penguins and my heart was broken. I was like, fuck. And then I saw the penguins. They were around the corner hiding like they were black people. They were hiding from the, the white in them. Um, but anyway. There was a VR reality set right across there. And then over here is the penguins. And over here is the VR reality shit. And over here is the penguins. And dude, you could swim underwater and be by the, the shipwrecked and shit over here. But there's cute, fluffy sea puppers over here. Sea puppies. Penguins are right over here. And I swear to you, Andrew, I'm like a four-year-old kid. Just like I can't decide which way to go. It was an amazing experience. So yeah, back to comics. Uh, <laughs> well, well, well. I, I, on that note, I, I do want to talk about my queen a little bit. Um, <laughs> hey, what's up, Autumn? How you doing? Looking good there, <laughs> dude. I wish I waited a, a a year to do that cover. Wait, no, I should have. Yeah, nah, she's buff. I was gonna say she's she's gotten even even more and more. Oh, <laughs> I should have waited a year. I should have been more in shape for that one. I didn't. I didn't pose. I didn't pose well <laughs> enough. The, the, I, I really like these covers. And, and, and when I become less poor, I'm going to go find them on eBay. Um, but but uh, it's unfortunate. I'm broke as fuck. I'm so broke that, that my Nikes look like they're retros. Um, <laughs> it's bad. terrible. It's terrible. Um, but, yeah, no, it's, it's getting back to comics. I mean, you mentioned something that people in comics really aren't all that business, business savvy. And so what is that like for you balancing that? Because I think it's a real challenge for people. And obviously, I mean, I run, I tend to be on the comic book investing and collecting side and I run my eBay business. So, and I'm not very good at creativity per se in comics. So yeah. it, it's weird. And I'm very curious, like, how do you manage that stuff? It, it's it's a skill. It, it's literally a skill. One that I am not very good at. Um, it's it's you you know, you know plenty of people plenty of people in your life. Of all the people you know, how many of them would you actually look at and say, okay, financially, that cat knows his shit. There's there's not a lot. There's hard yeah, workers. My group. There's hard workers. There's people that make money, but not many people. You're like that guy knows his shit. So I mean, you take that and you apply it to comics. It's the same fucking thing. We're all just kind of figuring this shit out as we go along. Some people just have a, a faster learning curve than others. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree because because the, the whole issue and where, where I'm going with this is that it takes money to produce comics. And when you're working for a company, you know, obviously there's somewhat footing the bill as long right. as you're producing it. And then it becomes their problem. And you hand them a script right. in a lot of ways. And then you get paid. And then if the book fails, they took the risk. But when you're on your own with Widow's Web and there's a few other things you've done, you're on your own and the Bill comes to you in a lot of ways. And yeah, so I, I worked with a publisher a very long time ago. I'm not going to say names, but they told me something. And this is kind of what I mean about perspective. 
they said something along the lines that when it's your house that you've mortgaged to pay for this business, then you get the final say. If you want to go mortgage your house to pay and make your own comics and run your own business, you can do whatever the fuck you want. And at the time, I thought it was a very uh, narrow-minded look at things because creatively, people who are creative genuinely know when shit is good. You know, we're the we're the ones who 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 put the put the quality content together, and then somebody comes and makes money off of it. But there is also the perspective that the creative individual often doesn't see the elephant standing in front of his face. You know, like sometimes it takes that good editor or good publisher to be like, I don't, I don't agree, you know, and, and it's their dime. So fuck it. But the, the, also, the publisher always used to say, he'd be like, if you want to do it, go out and do it yourself. I went out and did it myself and I sure as fuck wouldn't put up with the shit that I put other publishers through. Yeah. And also what, what I was going to say too, is that also sometimes, you know, what is when you're doing it yourself, you need people to say, hey, look, this is garbage. This is poo-poo on a stick. And sometimes you need people, and it's okay. If you want to mortgage your house, you can do whatever you want. I'm not going to stop anybody from doing anything. But there yeah. also gets to a point where, you know, it's sometimes, you know, the first thing you write is poo-poo on a stick, for lack of a better word. Oh, yeah. And I think, I think you know, it is, you know, if you're going to do it on your own, you need people to be, no, this is bad. And then you also need people to say, hey, look, this is good. And you need people to be very honest with you, I think. And I think it's very important in, in that regard. Yeah. And again, there's, there's always going to be a learning curve. There's going to be a growth. I mean, you look at uh, a very clear cut example, no record label wanted to pay Jay-Z, you know, and what happened because nobody thought he was good enough. He made his own company and is now a billionaire because no one thought he was good enough. But he obviously was good enough. You know what I mean? So it's like, uh, how much do you believe in yourself? How much have you exposed yourself to the world, seen what else is out there, and been like, I have a voice that has a unique message that wants to put whatever particular craft or, you know, you. Because everything we do is you in some way or form. You're selling you if it's a story, if it's art, if it's music. You're selling your life experiences. You're making your ideas have value. That's everything. Everything in the world. So, I mean, who's to say what idea has value and what idea doesn't? You know, what was that shit? Uh, what's the thing that we... Uh, they discovered on bread mold. The uh, amox... Not amoxicillin. Penicillin. Like that was discovered by accidents. Who who's to say what ideas have values and what ideas don't? If you no, 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 what, what I'm saying is that I'm saying, look, you know what it is? Sometimes you have to throw a bad idea before you get to a good one. I have started a bunch of different things in my life in the last 10 years. And I've run through four or five, you know, YouTube channels. I've run through three or four type of shows like this before I found something that I think is working and that is good. And obviously it has room to massively grow. And I am nowhere near where I want to be per se, but it took me almost 10 years to get to this stage. Right, and right. I had to throw out a bunch of bad ideas before I came to a good one. And it wasn't, and there was other things too, where I was killing myself producing content like four or five videos a day. And I was getting to the point where it was becoming a very, very bad habit. And it was taking up too much time. and I wasn't leaving my house. For, right. for, for weeks on end. And so I had to stop because it was bad. And also it wasn't going anywhere either. And that was the other problem. And so, but it took me a long time to get to this stage. Um, and so, but I don't regret me going through those ideas, yeah. and, but I recognize they were bad ideas too, but they taught me a lot of lessons. And so I yeah, think that, that's very important. But see, but th this is kind of what I'm getting at is, is, my, my viewpoint isn't really constricted by the prism of comics or, or business anymore. My, my perspective is more and like you were saying, it took you a lot of bad ideas to get to the good one, right? 
Well, you I can't be right once. I only need to be right once. Yeah, you can't get to those without the bad ones. Like I was a person after my wife died, I stopped really believing in not believing in God, but st I stopped talking to God. It took alcoholism and me becoming a drug addicted alcoholic to to find my way back to a relationship with a higher power. So no matter how bad that was, no matter how many psych wards, no matter how much detox, no matter how much bad mistakes I made, they all led me to a place where I'm happy for the first time in forever. And it's not because of money. It's not because of working. It's just because now I can look at things through the perspective that everything leads to everything. The bad leads to the good. I wouldn't be making comics if I didn't got if I didn't get fired from my job 20 something years ago and had no choice but to make a living off of comics I made my living off a mistake a mistake I made that got me fired brought me to this world you know so again I, I, it's it, it's it's weird man because I, I I can't see this shit 10 20 years ago. I can only see this now with this sexy gray peppered Reed Richards fit in my hair. Before I couldn't see it. Now so, it's so, to, to even talk about that because I'm 29. So obviously I have some wisdom, but but I have a lot less wisdom than you, than Pat Shan. You know, there, there's a few other people, you know, Travis Gibb is, is a good person. Wait, 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 let's clarify real quick, just in case anyone is watching this right now. Pat Shen is on the bottom of that list in wisdom. I don't care if he made 75, almost 100 grand on Kickstarter. He's short. He's a ginger. He is not deserving of anyone's consideration. He eats penis every day of his life, and there's nothing wrong with that because he loves it, and it makes him happy. Continue again. I'm sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to make sure that that was clear, that I support Pat Chan and his penis-eating lifestyle. By the way, Thirsty is now on Kickstarter. Pat Chan, he's made 75 grand. You should go support his shit so he can eat more penis for a living. Go ahead. And yeah, I was, oh, was going to say, right, Travis. Hold on. <laughs> hold on one second. Fuck Pat Chan. Fuck him. You're at San Diego right now saying, fuck Raven Gregory. I'm national, bitch. Fuck you. I'm on Andrew's podcast. You can't be on Andrew's podcast because you're at San Diego saying, fuck Raven Gregory. Fuck Pat Chan. Continue. I'm sorry. I just had to get that out. He posted a video, and he's just like, and as soon as I see the video, I'm like, oh, shit. I'm going to talk shit to Pat. And he just turns and looks at the camera, and he's like, fuck Raven Gregory. I'm like, this bitch is too good at this game. I'm like, shit. <laughs> I'm sorry, dude. I told you I'd go wild. i go off on tangents. We were talking about ping, ping, about sea lions, fucking penguins, and doing mushrooms in the aquarium, and now we're talking about Pat Shan sucking dicks for a living. Keep sucking your Kickstarter dick, Pat. Oh, hobbit-ass bitch. <laughs> But, but but as I was saying, in a serious way, I possibly can. What's crazy with this is that I don't know if Pat Chan's going to come on in like two weeks when we unbox a bunch of Xenoscope trading cards now. I don't know if he's going to come on. It's going to be great. Oh, man. Yeah, nobody tunes in for Pat Chan shit. Nobody gives a shit about his space in between. That just made 75 grand on fucking kicks. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Raven. We wear black masks on this show. <laughs> I hate I can't even talk shit about him no more. Now, not only has he written more comics than me, but he's freaking lapped me in Kickstarter. The guy's ran the novel, and he's a fucking black belt. Fuck that bitch. And he's married to a beautiful woman who models. Fuck that bitch. Pat Shen, 2022. Get at him. <laughs> that yeah, so 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 obviously, obviously, we're taking Patsy on off the list now. Um, we'll, yeah, we'll okay, yes, yeah, continue with penis. the list. Continue. <laughs> we're, Travis we're, we're, Gibbs, we're. that's where you're at, Travis Gibbs. <laughs> and, and 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 we'll throw Chuck Pino on that list too. Just 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 so. 
I, I still have some friends left in comics. Um, <laughs> but I mean, obviously, I have a lot less wisdom than everybody else, per se, because I'm just younger. But, you know, what, what is this like? Because you're a you have all this wisdom now and seeing it from a very different angle. And I think that's very useful because obviously, you know, the bad led into the good. And then obviously you're an unbelievably talented writer. You also pretty much put Xenoscope with, with some help on the map with Wonderland. I think that, that that's a safe assumption where nobody knew who Xenoscope was until Wonderland hit by definition. Um, and, and that's no disrespect to, to Ralph and Joe. Joe was just on, but I think that's a relative true because Wonderland changed the game for that company. And, yeah. you know, you, you were very instrumental in that. And, so what, what is this like? Because one of the things that I really like about you is that you did Wonderland, which was amazing. Then you did, you created Karis, and then you did a bunch of Van Helsing. And now you go off on your own. And I feel like you're showing that, hey, I'm not a one trick pony in a one trick company, for lack of a better word, where I could play outside of Xenoscope. And I think it's very, very cool what you've done. And I know you've done a bunch of other stuff. And what is that like for you? Because talking about, seeing it differently and everything. I mean, you know, I think you've run the gambit a lot and that you're really killing it right now in that realm. I, I feel that one of the best things people can do for themselves is to constantly challenge yourself and do things that make you feel uncomfortable. There have been so many times where I have sat and binge watched a movie and, and, and apologies if this gets a little philosophical, but there's been plenty of times I've sat and been watched a movie and been like, wow, that was an enjoyable experience. But then I'll go out and I'll do something difficult and that becomes a lifetime memory, you know? So my perspective on things after going out and doing it on my own is that I'm really just, I'm really on focusing on every day, make a concentrated effort to do more, to do better, to be better, but to enjoy the journey. Everything else is bullshit. If you can't enjoy where you are here and now, there's no fucking point to this shit. The point is, is to work hard, to enjoy the shit, to enjoy the moments so that you can cherish these moments. Because that's all we fucking got is a bunch of moments. Co if COVID taught us anything, this shit ain't permanent. We all had friends who got taken out by that shit. I had multiple friends get taken out by that shit. And in the midst of multiple friends being taken out by that shit, people just drop it. See, I was going to say another word. But I know you have sponsors. People just be dropping. I was going to say you another can word. say whatever word you want. I can't oh. say certain words. Oh, okay. Yeah, niggas be dropping left and right, man. Like, holy shit. Dude, one of my close personal friends, I saw her for the first time after five years. She was in a bar. We met. We hugged. And the next day, she died. Somebody killed her in a hit and run. And I'm like, dude. This, this chase thing we're doing, the chase, the chase to accomplish, that is what makes these moments worth it. If you're just laying there in life and letting life happen at you, you're missing the point because you can't have those moments you cherish without going after something. It, it isn't the saying, Mark Cuban says the saying, no balls, no babies, right? Yeah. And, yeah. And, and so, I mean, I made the announcement at the top of this show where I'm going out and I'm going to be teaching a whole comic book class. And I've got to the point where I'm like, look, I want to go start my own business. What do I know? And, and, and I started an eBay business and now I want to start the other side of that business, which is the teaching. And my whole point is that I want to be free, but I also want to financially educate people in this space because we have a lack of financial education in this entire country. We have a massively financial education problem. And you know, it, it, it's what do I know? And I think I'm an excellent teacher um, in this topic. In this topic, you know, it's, it's something I care about. And, you know, I said, fuck it. And I think that, you know, it's gonna be, I mean, 
I ran a Kickstarter in January. And the second I ran a Kickstarter, the second I actually deployed money, you know, the second I took out money, you know, I have a new appreciation for the entire process. Do I want to do it again? Oh, fuck no. <laughs> I don't want to do another Kickstarter if I don't have to. Yeah, yeah, I mean, <laughs> People don't realize how much, how much work goes into those things, man. Those things are, we did the math once. And the math comes out to, I think, like, Two dollars an hour is how much you are getting paid as a creator. If you were doing all the work yourself from conception to execution to fulfillment, you're getting paid under two dollars an hour. I mean, I, I had a miserable experience and I got a lot of hate on mine. And it, what, what what shocked me about it is that coming out of COVID and if you don't like my project, you don't have to say anything. And there were some high profile people who were talking shit about me. And 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 they they work for, for, for somewhat decent companies, and I'm not gonna say who, but there's a real issue and there's receipts coming. There's no question about it. Where right when I want to issue somebody a receipt, it's a wrestling term. You know, you're gonna get a receipt, just ask Randy Orton and he'll tell you all about what a receipt is, possibly from the Undertaker. But again, that's why I don't want to come back because I got so much heat and so much hatred, both publicly and privately, that it's just like, you know, I don't need to do that shit. I don't need to be attacked. What? Well, well, now I'm curious. Why, why were you getting hate? People didn't want to support the show and didn't want to advertise or didn't want to throw money to have a guaranteed guest spot when I'm booking 150 to 200 people and my list gets filled up quickly. And that's why people got pissed. You weren't paying to be a guest on the show. You were paying to have a guaranteed spot because I get booked quickly. <coughs> and, 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 and it's just the idea that if you want a spot in September, you got to reserve that spot. <coughs> Not saying that, that there might be a spot open for you in September, but there's also a good chance that there's not going to be because I get booked quickly. And, and, okay. it, it's me finding anywhere from 12 to 20 guests a month is easy now. It's a matter of, do you want that guarantee? And that's that's what my Kickstarter was. Is hey, that Andrew, Andrew can, I, can I take a moment real quick? Real quick. Um, what I'm about to say does not reflect Andrew's personal views. They are wholly and entirely my views. To all the motherfuckers who got shit to talk, y'all a bunch of bitches, shut the fuck up. If you got a problem with some shit, just don't fucking click on it. Why you got to comment? Why you got to hate on shit just because you don't fucking like the way it's fucking approached? It ain't your fucking time. Bunch of bitch-ass bitches. All right. Again, Even for me, so, so for, for, for me to just add to that, if yeah. somebody wants disagrees with my, my economic and my investment strategy, that's different than, 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 than attacking me bluntly and saying that, you know, you, you shouldn't be doing this, fuck off. Or, or, or A, B, C, and D, and making it an attack. A disagreement and an attack are two different things completely. And so it, they, they were attacks. And also said, I'm sorry that I can't help you. And people would just keep going. And so where I'm at is, you know, if you, if you don't like what I do, you don't like my show, you don't want to support this show, you know, that's fine. I don't take anything personal. Yeah. It, it, but, but, but if you're going to tell me how to run my business, when you pay my mortgage and you pay my rent, you get a stake in the business. You'll get a percentage, and then there you go. So if you want to tell me how to run my business, then become an investor and we could talk. Yeah. Yeah, that's real. That's real. I mean, yeah, that, I mean, dude, you know, it's really, it's really fucking funny that I've, I don't know, I don't know how I've been blessed in this particular fashion, or maybe I'm just, maybe I'm just obtuse when it comes to this, but I've never heard of the haters. I've never heard. I've never been attacked. I've been attacked maybe, maybe a couple times about those covers. They were like, Oh, there was a period where everyone was talking shit about the Zenoscope covers. Cause they were provocative and no one thought. And, and, you know, in hindsight, I realized that uh, somebody made a comment years ago about the writers of Zenoscope. They were like, well, no one's going to take you seriously if all you do is write romance novels. And I was like, eh, I get what you're saying, but fuck them. I love Zenoscope. I thought Zenoscope did dope-ass shit. 
but I get what they mean. But, 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 but uh, I'm going to throw something to you. Sorry mm-hmm. to interrupt. But here, here's how I view it. What if somebody writes romance novels, but they're worth a billion dollars? Who cares? It, I'll write romance novels all I want if I'm making real money. Because guess what? There gets a point where somebody writes romance n- novels or stories and they are supporting themselves. They enjoy writing. They enjoy what they're writing. And they're wealthy, and maybe they got two kids, and they're paying for their kids' college, and their kids aren't in debt. And you know what it is? They're doing all right, and people appreciate their work, and their books are selling. You know, at the end of the day, I'm not saying that it's all about the money, but that's the other thing, too, is that if – this is what I don't understand. Zenoscope is extremely profitable. They're a healthy company. So you could go shit on Zenoscope, and, and I think I could say this. I don't think Ralph or Joe is going to get too angry with me. But they're working. They're growing their fan base. So yeah. you could hate them all you want. But guess what? They're a growing company. So at, at what point does the proof, you know, stop the haters? And what I think it then becomes is that people are jealous. The, the, yeah, that's really what it comes down to. You know, for years, people would say those things to me, and I never got it. I never got where. And here's the here's the funny thing is. There is a lot of shit that we as people personally dislike because if you really peel back the layers behind it, it's because you're jealous. Every human's the same fucking way. Everybody sees something that looks amazing and they want it. And if it belongs to somebody else, even though you don't really want it, it's like having an ex-girlfriend who starts dating somebody new. You want the ex-girlfriend back because somebody's playing with your fucking toy. You know, it's it's one of those things where you, you, you kind of are setting yourself up to always be looking and comparing shit. You just can't fucking help it. So I think a lot of hate, a lot of hate is people like there's this big one right now that everybody's talking about. And I made common comment to it, too, because I hated the fact that the term woke has been taken and turned into some bullshit. Like I, I was explaining to some of the other day, the 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 way that word is meant to be used is it's meant to enlighten you to something that you have known your whole life but never really knew. And the example I gave them is I said, "Hey, do you know why there's freaking systematic racism in police departments?" They said, "No." I said, "Do you know what the first police departments were? The police for first police force was." It was people that used to capture runaway slaves. That's where the police formed. And I'm like, oh, now you're woke. But this guy freaking. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. There you go. Google it after the interview. Crazy shit. The origins of the police force. Have fun, kids. But (laughs) this guy, this, uh, fuck it, this black creator. Did this amazing you can, who is. you can say who is. I don't care. Yeah, I don't know his name. Uh, he put out this amazing first-time comic. I think he's made $2 million or $200 million in pre-sales alone. But the pitch to it was, I'm doing an anti-woke story. That's what his pitch was. That's what he broadcasted. The book isn't even out yet. It does not have established creators that would guarantee the sale of said book. It's not like Stephen King put out a fucking book and sold it, 2 million units. This it's, guy, it's not J.K. Rowling putting out this you. book of Harry Potter. This guy has literally made 2 million or 200,000 so, however so, off of saying anti-woke. Let me let me tell you what I think about that, right? Because because I haven't spoken about this, and, and I'm probably gonna speak about it in like about 45 minutes. Yeah, um, it was of my friends live. So here's what I think it is. I think the book is average. I think we're we're in the realm. This happened with alcohol, you know, you know, a while back, where all these celebrities were putting out tequilas and rums and vodkas, and it became a brand. That's what this is. We saw it with Wesley Snipes. Wesley Snipes just put out a book. The book is average. And I understand people are going to get pissed when I say this. It's average. It's a basic book. There's nothing wrong with the book. It's okay. If you pick it up, it's well worth the money that you spend. If you spend 50 bucks on it, it's a $50 book. But it's nothing special. 
And that's what this book is. And it's nothing against this creator. And I know a bunch of you are going to hate on me for this. But here's the whole thing. This guy had a following before. That's why this book did $2 million. This, this whole thing from a business cycle is somebody had a following and they leveraged their following and they branded it correctly. This is not a comic book play. And I'm going to throw names out there. I know you told Pat Chan to fuck himself. Pat Chan built a legitimate business from zero. Travis Gibb built a business from zero. You know, you know, Larry Higgins with IOB Comics built a business from zero. I think you with Widow's Web built a business from zero. People like Mike Chrome have built a brand. People like me, I. People like Tom Hutchinson with Big Dog Inc. have built a brand from zero. And so when I look at this book, I say to myself, this is something that was leveraged. That's an average book that does not warrant $2 million, $3 million, $4 million worth of sales. I'll throw another name. Black Sands has built a business from zero. Now, they got outside investment, but they still built up business from zero. And that's my problem with this book is that, and also this book is not repeatable, which means it is a fad, not a trend. And, and I'm going to get hate for that. And I got no problem saying that because I think it's true. Well, I can't, I can't, uh, I can't uh, qualify the quality of the book or the story because I haven't read it. I was talking just from the marketing aspect of sales are usually driven by an established property an established creator, um, established cover artist, and then there's the gimmicks, and then there's the marketing. And the marketing on this book is again, it's never going to be able to be repeated, but it kind of has been. They marketed it as an anti woke book, which basically means, like, realistically speaking. Anti-woke is basically like anti-gay, anti-LGB, anti-redneck, there's racism, blah, 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 all that bullshit. And, like, it's okay to be fat, blah, 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 all that shit that we're not allowed to talk about. That's basically when you say what anti-woke is. That's not what it's supposed to be. But he took that and appealed to that demographic, which is very, very vocal and strong about getting their voice out. And got it on the right television networks and got it on the right media. And that's what translated into these crazy, insane number sales. I admire that he gained the system. I can't, I can't, again, I can't qualify what the work was. Like, same with Wesley Snipes. I'm like, that makes sense. Wesley is the one who started comic book shit. He was a fan before play. No, 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 no. But my, my, my point is that I, I know how this plays out. I just know how this plays out. I don't even need to qualify. And I understand people might shit on me, but when people get their book, they're going to be like, okay, this was an average book. Okay. But what I'm saying is e Ethan Van Schuyver did this same shit a year ago. He, he weaponized anti-woke sentiment and made his money. I'm not going to hate on a motherfucker just finding a way to make fucking money. Oh, I got no problem with that either. Because, I'm a capitalist. Because if, if like, here's the thing, and, and this was posed to me a long time ago. Somebody said, here's where it gets weird. Here, here where, here's where content creation gets weird is you have to be true to you, right? But you also have to pay bills. So you're going to compromise integrity somewhere along that line to what you're willing to accept. And somebody said to me once, they're like, well, Raven, why do you put these hot chicks on the covers? And I'm like, hot chicks sell. And I remember one time I stood my ground and did a cover. It was a David Mack cover uh, for Fly Volume 2. And it did not sell as good. And I took into factors, it was a second series, it was actually issue six, and I was like kind of disappointed, but it was like true to a vision. And I think back to it now in hindsight, which do I prefer? And all I realize is, I don't give a fuck. I really don't. I'm just like, you know, 
you put out what you put out and you try to stay true to you as best as you can. And that's all you can do. So, 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 I mean, look, you know, it is, I, I get that bad girl art sells. I love bad girl art. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I convinced my mom and, and I told this story once before I'm going to tell right now. So my mom isn't too happy that I buy Xenoscope covers and I don't buy the Z-rated covers because they're a pain in the ass to sell on eBay. Because eBay sometimes cracks down on that shit and I just don't want my eBay store shut down or suspended because if i have a good business i'm not about to fuck it up right don't you hate when they do that shit it, 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 it makes sense for me because if i'm already making a three <laughs> on a xenoscope book why would i want to make you know i'd rather sell two books instead of a z-rated one of a z-rated book and make the same amount of money and not have them busted my balls it, 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 it's just it's just it, i could go path a or path b and I'm making the same amount of money either way. So it doesn't matter to me. But it's the idea that when my mom's like, oh, you're buying this stuff. I'm not happy with you. And then when she saw how much money I was making, she's like, oh, I have a change of heart. Because <laughs> she realized that all of a sudden I buy something for 20 bucks and then I turn it into 60. There you go. And so, you know, but Zenoscope covers sell and they make money. So they're, they're, there you go. I did not realize there was a bunch of people talking over here. Hey, Chuck Pinu, I just want to say shout out, fuck you too. I don't want you to feel left out. Um, Facebook user, whoever you are, fuck you too. Don't want you to feel, I'm not saying fuck. I say fuck you as in I love you. It's like I, I, I was the other day, uh, I was talking about, I call, Jesus Christ. <laughs> I just read some of these comments. These motherfuckers are funny as shit. Hey. No, just like the other day, when I call my friends, I call my friends and I call them baby girl. And I was like, I found out women don't like being called babe. And I'm like, I like using the word babe. I call all my friends babe. I also call all my friends bitches. So it's like, like fuck all you motherfuckers. I love you. And I call my friends stuff too that, 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 that I don't feel like saying because they're not going to like me when I say it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I call my friends, I call one of my friends daddy. I do it publicly. Oh my god, that's so good. When to do there's something I had somebody do that to me once, and it makes your brain like misfire. You're like, no, ah, ah, no, 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 stop. So really, I do it. All it's time. funny when you do it in a diner. It's really <laughs> funny when you do it in a diner. It's almost as funny as the time that me and my friends were were doing in karate. You 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 yell and you punch sometimes, right, to get the yeah. air out. And so I did that too once and all my friends did it too. And it was the funniest time ever. <laughs> Every other word you're just keying. Oh my God. It was sick. Oh, that's dope. That's dope. Right. But, but I like to call my friend daddy in public places, especially when there are women around because it's even funnier. <laughs> oh, that's, that's fucking, that's yeah, man. That shit's the best. That shit is the best. <laughs> what the hell? Why the what? No, stop. I, oh, my gosh. No, Siri, stop. Why? Siri just popped up on the side of my computer and was like, what can I do for you? <laughs> I'm like, no, bitch, stop talking. What the shit? Hold on. So, hey, Siri. So, no, is it coming So, so obviously, now, now, now that we've established that I'm not going to get an interview with, with the woke comic here. Thank you, Raven, for that. <laughs> I, I wasn't going to get an interview anyway, and it's honestly not that interesting of a book to talk about. Um, no, it is know. interesting. I mean, dude, how many people get to this? Only happens like once or twice a year. Somebody figures out how to climb the mountain without climbing the mountain. This is this is what this is literally what life is. Every once in a while, one of us normal people are like, "Wait a minute, let's rip off the rich people and make GameStop worth millions." <laughs> That was pretty funny. That was you know what I mean? Funny. Every year, one of us is like, hey, wait a minute. They're betting against GameStop. Let's call our buddies and say, do you know? Do you actually know what the consequence for that is? Do you actually know the biggest consequence for that? What? The company that had the biggest short is actually liquidating their entire thing and shutting down. Isn't that insane? Yeah, I heard they, they actually took out the people that were betting on failure. 
I mean, I mean, look, you know what it is? You know, it is, I don't really know what GameStop does anymore. I don't know what the purpose of GameStop is. But all I know is that they sell Pokemon cards in GameStop. So I'm happy. And so is Pat Chan. So yeah. there we go. <laughs> yeah. For those who are not aware, Pat Chan is a giant geek nerd of the highest proportion who loves Pokemon. He actually has a massive body-sized Pikachu that he sleeps with at night. It has a little hole where the vagina would go so that his penis doesn't feel alone and he could say Pika Pika all through the night. True story. I'm not even going to lie. Ask him to send you a picture of his bedroom. There is a giant Pikachu on that bed. I'm, I'm a little disappointed. I thought it would have been a Snorlax. He, he well, he has a tattoo on his back of a Snorlax. <laughs> like when he comes out of bushes from behind, people could be like, "Hey, when did Snorlax get red hair?" <laughs> You're just terrible. You're just terrible. And this is after all the nice things he said about you on my show <laughs> a while back. <laughs> That's good. Keep, yeah, this is funny, dude. I think I think he's he's like no joke. I think he's one of the most amazing individuals not to go gay on this podcast but he's i'm there are only a few people like i'm glad everybody's alive but there's only a few people that i can look at and speak to every single day and say man you make this world you make my existence a better place and pat, I, I, can, I can name at least one of them besides pat yeah who a uh, nia yeah nia is my other one Nei, Mike, Pat, and John. Those are my those are my cats that make this life a better freaking place. I don't I don't know I don't know John, but but I do know Mike Tabapo very well. Uh, John, John Hartley is, is my uh, my comedic buddy. He's my comedy buddy. Yeah, yeah. Speaking speak about comedy, because 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 you got some serious balls for doing that, man. I mean, I don't think people understand how difficult it is to public speak let alone go up and try to make people laugh because it, I mean, you, have you seen the, the Bill Burr defends a uh, new comic video? On, yeah. on YouTube? Like they, and that, that, that was bad. I mean, that, that, that was bad. I'm going to, I'm going to use in a word. It's a hop on an issue, but that made abortion look good. That's a, that's how bad that, that, that video was for that comedic. And Tony Hitchcliffe was being a douchebag for lack of a better word. Um, and if you haven't seen send me, it, send me the link to this. I haven't seen this. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll send you the link in, in, in a minute. It's one of those things where it, it's just that, like, it was bad. It was, it was bad. It's, it's exactly. If you haven't seen it, look it up. Bill Burr defense com, comedian, comedian. I mean, you. Everybody will agree with me. The point that I'm getting at is, it is hard to do stand up. And so, what is this like for you? Because you're obviously coming in from writing and writing comics and having a very successful career there. And now you're in a whole new sector. And so what's up with that shit? It's it's the most wonderful experience I've ever had in my life. I, I can't even properly put into words how it feels like when I first discovered writing and that fire gets lit and you're like, I'm going to be a writer or whatever you decide that you're true north. That's what this feels like. This feels when I'm on stage and I'm hitting that set perfect, it feels like I'm home, like this is what I'm meant to do. Those things in this life are so far and few between and so rare. It's like falling in love for the first time. That's what it feels like. It feels, I, it feels like jumping out of an airplane with no parachute. And whether or not you crash is entirely up to you and an audience. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and to even go further into this, because obviously stand up is something I would love to do at some point in my life. Um, I just have to figure out how to stand up first because I walk on crutches and I suck at that. Um, but, 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 yeah, so maybe I'll have to do it sitting down. I don't know. Um, no, man, man the, the disabled people, the disabled community, they come out for that shit. They're all on stage and they're moving up on stage and everything. I, when I was in a wheelchair for a couple weeks, I went up there and I'm like, dude, I feel really bad for disabled comedians. Like really bad. Not because they're disabled, 
but because we have been taught not to laugh at these motherfuckers our whole life. So that's a tough crowd. That is a tough crowd of genetically engineered, I'm not supposed to laugh, but no, man, we got some of the dopest freaking comedians I know personally have disabilities that they just don't let hold them back. This one cat named Mike Boland has no hand, and he was the first comedian that made me belly laugh, like hurt your belly laugh. And every time I see him, he makes me belly laugh. And it's just him putting himself out there, like who he is, what his thoughts are based off the things that have happened to him that he's putting out into the world, man. It's freaking, it's dope, man. I highly recommend it to everyone. It's one of the most exciting things you can do in your life for free. You just find an open mic and see how it tastes. Yeah, no, 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 no. Cause, cause, cause it, it, I mean, people are terrified of public speaking. I mean, you know, you know, you know I, I reach out to a lot of guests. People are terrified to do this. And yeah. I don't think I'm that intimidating. I mean, I, if I am, well, you know, I don't know what to say, and I'm sorry. Um, I don't bite. Um, Excuse me one second. Uh, this uh, following view is not reflective of Andrew over here. These are entirely it, 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 It's fine. You can say whatever you want. Hey, if you said to go do a podcast in your own room, in the comfort of your own bed or wherever domicile, you a bitch. Quit being a bitch. Get out your comfort zone. Learn to live and do something. Quit jerking off to that porn. Pat, quit jerking off to my face. I know you like the way this shit looks. Quit looking at my mouth, Pat. Quit thinking them dirty thoughts. Those dirty hobbit short willow thoughts. Cut that shit out, you pippy long socking looking motherfucker. Uh, but back to what you were saying about, uh, yeah, let's continue. Comedy, it's a wonderful thing. I enjoy it. Yeah, no, 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 because because it, it, it's one of those things that I think people don't realize. And what I was getting at is that it's very, very scary. And for you to put yourself out there, I mean, it's just mad props is all I'm going to say. Thank it's you. Mad. I appreciate that, man. It's it's uh, I get more out of it than I than I deserve. A lot of people will say good things afterwards, and I'm like. You have no idea how much I get out of just being on that stage. You you just you absorb energy on there and you're just throwing it out in this vicious cycle. It's it's the closest I it's like sex. It's very much like sex. There's this weird give and take to that shit up there. I got to remember that shit. I might use that in a comedy act. 